to thank everyone for being here for um, First Tuesday at the Metro Archives. Appreciate you coming. Uh, if you're viewing from home, thank you. Um, basically, today we have a, a special guest. Um, we have Sharon Hurt, who is uh, she's council member at large, and she's also uh, over the first district right now. Um, and she's going to speak to us about JUMP. It's the um, Jefferson Street United Merchants Partnership. Um, she's worked with that and brought it along quite well, and she coordinates the Jefferson Street Jazz and Blues Festival, which draws about 30,000 people a year. So it's, it's interesting to see, and I love that area growing. Um, next month in March, we'll have Debbie Watts. You may remember her. She was with the um, Tom Ryman Diaries, and she's going to come and speak to us about um, share, taking history to the stage. So that'll be next month. Uh, but for right now, I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Hurt, and she'll come and talk to you about Jump. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, now, you know, we're talking about Jefferson Street, and y'all got to do a little bit better than that. <laughs> we're talking about where it was jumping. So we're going to try that again, okay? okay. Good, afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Talking about Motown and coming down through there, everything he said was just a perfect segue for me to tell you about Jefferson Street and the way things were back in the 40s and 50s and 60s because it was absolutely happening right then. If you just close your eyes and think about lights everywhere, people everywhere, and you walking down the street and you walk around and say, is that little Richard? Oh my God, you go on a little bit further. James Brown, oh my God, Aretha Franklin, that's the way it was down on Jefferson Street. Well, should I say uptown Jefferson Street? It was absolutely happening. It was the wonderful thing. Jefferson Street was the main artery for the black community. And it was the entertainment, the music, that made it such a rich, rich history. That along with the institutions that are there, you've got Tennessee State University, Meharry Medical College, Fisk University, and even American Baptist Colleges across the river, but they'd sneak over there. I mean, you know, they're ministers, so, you know, they were there for church, and they were not there to go to the nightclubs. But we had about 17 nightclubs on Jefferson Street during that time. And anybody heard of Jimi Hendrix? Now, I know some of you know, but do you all know how Jimi Hendrix got to Jefferson Street? Do you know? He was in the service, he was in the army, and he was stationed over at Fort Campbell. And he heard about all of this good music over there on Jefferson Street, and he wanted to come and see what it was like. Got over there and saw people like D. Ford Bailey Jr. who get on that base and just do it to him. And then he saw Johnny Jones and just so many others that were there, and he was like, oh my, I am home now. And he, took off. Once he, you know, Johnny Jones said that he and Jimi Hendrix went at it one night and he was like, and they were just playing and playing and playing. And he did his thing and Jimmy did his and he came back and did his and Jimmy did his. And he said then he just flipped this switch and just took it to a whole nother level. And he was like, I mean, everybody just went wild and crazy. And he beat Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix didn't know he just out-amped him. His amp was just a little bit louder <laughs> than, than, than the one that Jimi had. Jimi couldn't bring the amp all the way from Fort Campbell. But that's what it was about. I mean, we had anything and everything that you wanted on Jefferson Street. The nightclubs, the Ritz Theater, all, there was a bowling alley, a skating rink, all kinds of eateries. And in the mix between of all of those things is where residents were, where they lived. You had the doctors, the lawyers, the dentists, all of the people, educators, all living right there in the same community next to each other. And they were there, you know, back in the day, you would get the, the, the doctor had a doctor's office and they also fixed televisions in the office and you can get your iron fixed over there <laughs> and all of those things. And it was just a wonderful community. And the people there had money. 
to where they could support all of these things. And, and uh, I hear that, that Ma, uh, Muhammad Ali was over there once, Bob, and over at the Day of Morocco. You heard of the Day of Morocco. That was his favorite. And he was there one night, and the police decided that they wanted to pay a visit over to the Day of Morocco. I don't know why they did everything legally, but they had to come over to Day of Morocco, and they got some students from Tennessee State. I don't know, you all know Michael McBride. He's an artist, yeah. one of his older brothers said that he had to sneak in the back door, get Muhammad Ali, put him in the car, and drove him out. He had to go, he, had to, he couldn't even cut his lights on. He had to drive all the way from Jefferson Street to 65 with no lights to get uh, Muhammad Ali on, the, on his way back to Louisville, Kentucky. So nothing could happen to him. But it was the days. There was another gentleman said that he was there and uh, he wasn't supposed to be there. He was about 14 years old. And he was looking out, and there was Aretha Franklin. And he was in there smoking a cigarette. And she looked at him, and she said, give me a drag off of that cigarette. He gave her that cigarette, and she pulled off of it and gave it back to him. And it had bright red lipstick on it. <laughs> his son said that his dad still had that little cigarette that Aretha <laughs> smoked on. It was so, so funny. But there were so many stories like that that were on Jefferson Street. And it was just amazing. I know Cab Calloway and um, Duke Ellington was at the Ritz Theater. You think about those people. At the same time, you had Langston Hughes and um, uh, Honor Bontemps over at Fisk University. All of these names of people who've done some outstanding things right here in Nashville. And there, you know, it was all started by the Fisk Youth Jubilee Singers. Because Nashville is known for Music City, and many would think it's because of country music, but it's actually because of the Fisk Jubilee Singers. They were traveling all over the country, and Queen Victoria saw them. And she said they sang so beautifully that they must be from Music City, USA. And that's how Nashville got that name. So they came back because they were raising money for them to be able to continue to go to school at Fisk University. And they raised enough money for them to go and for other scholarships for students to be able to uh, take advantage of those scholarships and, and attend school. And that's the way it was done, that we all worked together. It was a united effort for us to make things happen for the greater good of us all. Those were the days. They were the glory days, the glory, glory days on Jefferson Street. You know, they had a cotton club in uh, New York, in Harlem, where everybody would go to, and they dress up with their long gowns and all of their sparkles. Nashville had their own version of the Cotton Club. It was Brown's Supper Club. They even had one of the long chandeliers that they had in Harlem. And people would come every Saturday night. They couldn't wait to get off work so they could dress up and go to the Cotton Club. But you know one thing I had? There was a club called Club Revelot. And there's a gentleman here that stays over there at the Hilton Hotel every now and then, says that he loved Club Revelot. His name is Richard Penniman. You might know him as Little Richard. He says he loved it. He loved Club Revelot, and Revelot is named after a gentleman whose last name was Tolliver. So that's where Revelot comes from. It was, it was Tolliver spelled backwards. Yeah, mm, isn't that something? And that's how we came up with the name. But you had the Club Revelot and Good Jelly Jam, and you had the Brown Supper Club and Del Morocco, Club Stillaway, Club Baron. Was, is, is the only club that we now have standing on Jefferson Street that was there back in the day. And it's uh, now the Elks Club, where the Elks Lodge resides. That's the only club, and it was called the Club Baron. And so it was glory days during that time. But as it came on, as we got to the Civil Rights Movement and things were happening, 
things began to change. Although there's one thing that happened during that time that was great. And that was that Martin Luther King would visit Nashville, visit Fisk University all the time. And you may have seen it somewhere where Martin Luther King said that he came to Nashville to be inspired, not to bring inspiration because of all the things that he saw take place here during the civil rights movement and how our people came together. Again, that unity is what made it happen. I think that's why Nashville is so different because long ago, blacks and whites came together. They fought together, they loved together, they cried together, and they made this beautiful city together. And now they're calling it the It City, but we were the It City back then, they just didn't know it. But it was great, it was great. And you know what, as the time came, integration in the interstate. That's when we started to see things change. A lot of people think just the, the bringing of the interstate on Jefferson Street is what tore the community down. It wasn't just that, we got a double blow. With the interstate coming and integration. You know, as I was saying, when it was all of those things happening, that was the only place African Americans had to go, right there in their own community. They couldn't go anywhere else, so they were there supporting one another. Then integration came and they were able to go to Kane Sloan's downtown, or they were able to go to some of the other shops, to the Walgreens and Woolworths that they had downtown, to the movie theater, and therefore they were leaving the Ritz Theater to go downtown. And the interstate also played a major part. But you know, blacks and white came together with that. TDOT decided they wanted to bring an interstate through and the community said, no, we don't want it. There were professors from Fisk, Meharry, and Vanderbilt who came together and they fought it. I mean, they fought hard. And it must have gone two years before a decision was made. It went all the way to the Supreme Court before it was determined that they could actually bring the interstate to Jefferson Street. And then is when it basically brought things down. Because during, before all of that time, we had about 60,000, almost 70,000 people living in that North Nashville community. Can you imagine 70,000 people coming and living in that community, able to support the businesses? It was flourishing. It was viable. Commerce was great. The economy was good. As soon as that interstate was finished and complete, half of the residents were wiped out. So it immediately just, and the business community wiped out. So you didn't have the people who were living there with the kinds of incomes that we needed. And, and, and you had um, people who had left because of their friends leaving, because the church left, the businesses left, because many people had the businesses uh, in the same building that they lived in. We're moving back to that now. You know, things evolve. History does repeat itself. And we're going back to that model now. But back then, a lot of people lived in the same building that their businesses were. And they had to leave and moved way out. And that made it a problem for the Jefferson Street community because we no longer had people there who could actually support the businesses and unfortunately, because you didn't have as many people there supporting it, in order for people to survive, they had to raise the prices on a lot of things that they had. And when you have the community of people who are not making the same kind of money, it just goes down and down. And probably every 10 years, in this, it was 60,000 people in the 60s. In the 70s, it went down to about 50,000. In the 80s, it went down to about 40,000. In the 90s, it went down to about 30,000. In the mid 90s, between 95 and 2000, we had about 23,000 people living in that community. It had gone down. And not only that, but you had a lot of vacant buildings at that time. 
blighted areas because you had people who left, moved out of town, the kids that were growing up during that time, gone to school, graduated, moved to different places, and there were absentee landlords, and they didn't really take care of the property. And we still see some remnants of that now. And it was really, really hard. Hard for the community, hard for the people there. People didn't want to come. You know, it was kind of isolated because you couldn't get through. You know, everything basically came to that community and it stopped. Interstate came in and you got dead ends everywhere. You go straight to, to Scoville Street. They used to go the, the length of Jefferson Street from East Nashville to West Nashville. And it stops because of the interstate. Picks up on the other side and go for about a block and it stops again. So it's just disconnected. Disconnected from everything and all of the people that were there. You know, some things that are there were there then are still there, like the Citizens Bank. It was called One Cent's Bank, and they started there in 1904, and they are still there today. Odie Center, some of them survived, but most of them did not. Most of them had to leave, moved out. And some of them were paid. They, they, they sold their properties, and they were bought. And, you know, I didn't find that out. I thought they were all just totally displaced. But I did a, my dissertation, uh, getting a master's degree in nonprofit leadership at Belmont, and found that, um, that many people were offered money to, to leave and to sell their homes in order for them to bring the interstate, where it had been seen, thought by many that it was just a displacement of people which was, you know, it, it was bittersweet for me to find that out because that means that some families got money and they did well, got bigger homes, opened up businesses, and they were able to do much better. But it had seemed before that it was just, the, it was the worst, that they came in and pushed us out, and we had nowhere else to go. But that was not quite the truth. But then you get to the 90s, and mm, we were down, but we weren't out. That's what I say, that it was hope alive. If you go on Jefferson Street today, you can feel the spirit there. You can feel the ancestors there. Because there's greatness in that community. There's greatness all over. All of those people that I talked about that made it happen during that time, they left something there, and it was great. And I know I still feel it. I think I get things. I glean from those people who were there in order for me to keep going and keep doing what I do. And, and it made a difference. You still had churches like the Schrader Lane Church was on Jefferson Street, and it was called the Jefferson Street Church of Christ. And they had to move, so they moved around the corner to Schrader Lane, and they're now Schrader Lane Church of Christ. And some of the other churches that were in the community helped. The universities being there helped maintain and sustain that community. They're the <laughs> pillars of that community. And then they got this organization you know, uh, Councilman Ludy Wallace was the councilman of District 19. And that district has a lot of Jefferson Street, and it also brings in quite a bit of downtown. And Ludy Wallace saw that there was this organization called Downtown Partnership that supported the downtown community. And he said, well, can we get a organization to support Uptown Nashville. And that Uptown he called Jefferson Street. And they got a little money and they created this organization called Jump. How be fitting because we had to jump up and make some things start jumping. <laughs> and I think that, that from that point on things started to change. Things started to be different. And it started, as a matter of fact, 
Jump received its designation as a 501c3 in 1996. So that means that we're celebrating our 20th year this year. How about that in the green? I'm so excited. I am so excited. It was September of 1996 that they received it because it was a pilot program from 1993 to 1996. They wanted to see how it would work, if people would be interested. Can they unite together? Can we do some things together? And it did, and it happened. And we were able to put all that information together and send it to IRS and say, we want to create this organization called JUMP. The Jefferson Street United Merchants Partnership. As I told you before, it was the unity of people that came together to make it all happen. And I think that's what's going to continue to make it all happen, is the unity of us as people together, united, to make it all happen. But we got that thing going called JUMP and got some redevelopment districts over there, the Phillips Jackson Redevelopment District, 1995. And they decided that they were able to get monies in order to build up the community. And it's interesting how you have the opportunity or you get the authority to do things, but it takes years for it to develop into actually becoming something. And you know, we had Germantown during that time over there too, which was also predominantly black. And, and the area was not uh, a place that people really wanted to come and be. Salem Town, there were some beautiful structures and beautiful homes, but the community in the area was not well taken care of. So it wasn't the most attractive and the most enticing community for people to want to be. But as I said, Jefferson Street was going on. Terry Chapman was the first executive director of JUMP and did some amazing things in setting that foundation. I came along in 1999, and I'm originally from Memphis, and I thought when I came here, this was the best place in the world. I'm like, oh my God, I cannot believe you see how clean it is here. And I was just looking and they were telling me, I, my husband was my boyfriend at the time and he was in school at Fisk. And I went over there and I told, I was talking to some of my classmates at Tennessee State and told them that I wanted to, um, that I was going to Fisk and my husband's dorm was over there by um, these townhouses. And they were like, what townhouses? I said, townhouses over there. Is they on a street like called some man's name, Joe Johnson or somebody, and those townhouses over there. I said, there ain't no townhouses over there. I'm like, yes, they are. They're real nice townhouses. They, you know, and they said, girl, those are the projects. They didn't look like projects I knew out of Memphis <laughs> because it was totally different. They were really really nice, and that's why I love Nashville. And I would walk down the street, we would walk from Tennessee State to the Farmer's Market, which is, you know where the Farmer's Market is, and that's a long way. And what well, I think is a long way now, but I guess when you're 18 years old, <laughs> it was an easy trek to go, but we would, and it, the Farmer's Market as we know now was not the Farmer's Market that was then. But we would go to the farmer's market, and the people were friendly, and we had a wonderful time. We looked forward to doing that. And of course, throughout the years, it didn't stay the same. But because of the work that JUMP did, it created this organization to help support the businesses on Jefferson Street, to give them a united uh, voice that we're going to stand for. Because, you know, it's so many people. It was a 25 block from 3rd Avenue to 28th Avenue. And, that, and because of so many businesses, at one time there was probably 150 businesses on Jefferson Street. This is when the, not even when the nightclubs were there. This was in the 90s, in the early 2000s. And, and within that time, we did have a lot of blighted areas, a lot of absentee landlords, and people not doing what they needed to do with the properties. 
We were down, but we were not out. We knew that there was hope, and we're going to keep hope alive, and we were just going to do things little by little. So I came on with Jump in, 1990, in 1999, and I was upset because they never cut the grass over there. So I called T. Dot and I said, you know, you all need to cut the grass. And they would come and cut the grass, and they would not come back again until I called and tell them they need to cut the grass again. I'm like, now this just doesn't make sense. I don't understand. And you know, 1999 was also a big year for us because this, this sports team came to town. I don't know, you might have heard of them and had a couple of people known their names, like Steve McNair, anybody know him? Or Drew Bennett, you know him? Uh, Eddie George, yeah, yeah, he was a Heisman. So I don't know, was it Tennessee? Were they the Oilers? They came during that time, and then they uh, came and named them the Tennessee Titans. Yeah, and then I think in that year they won several games and moved on, and that AFC championship they won and went to the Super Bowl. And I'm like, wait a minute. These guys doing all of these wonderful things and these great things, and they making a lot of money. And their practice field is a chip shot away from Jefferson Street, even where they play on Sundays. You can throw a baseball over there, and if they making a gazillion dollars, some of that money needs to come to Jefferson Street. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, especially since most of them were of African-American descent, and it looked like to me that they should be trying to invest money into their own community. Doesn't that make sense? Am I the only one that see that? Does that make sense? Then it kind of goes together, right? Yeah. Does it go together, right? Okay, then we're going to do this again like we did it. <laughs> that makes sense to me because, you know, you had all of these guys of African-American descent. They were playing football, and they were making a gazillion dollars, and I just knew that they could invest money into their own community and make it a better community. Didn't that make sense? Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I figured. I said, now, they need to do something over here for us. And I just don't know what it is. And it's just something that has to be done because this just doesn't make any sense to me. And I'm calling and asking to cut the grass over here. And I'm watching Channel 5 News. I have to give kudos to Channel 5 all the time, watching Channel 5 News. And they said, do you know that Eddie George is graduating from the Ohio State University with a degree in landscape architect? I was like, what? That's my ticket. Because if I can get him to join me to help clean up Jefferson Street and make it pretty, then we might be on to something. Because I had been attending meetings that said, at, you know, with the community, the community, the planning commission has these meetings with the sub-area A's. They called them sub-areas then. And they wanted to know what you want to happen in the community. And I remember they talked about it, and they said, you know, they started this years ago, and they told, asked us what we wanted, and we told them that we wanted somewhere for us to grow some corn and to store our corn. And they was like, no, you don't need that. I think you all need some outhouses out this way. And they were like, no, we need a place to store our corn. And they said, no, well, you need outhouses. So they decided to build the outhouses, and they came back. And to see how the people liked the outhouses, you know what happened? They went to the outhouse and opened the doors, and what was in there? Corn. <laughs> and, <laughs> so they decided, OK, well, maybe we need to listen to them and see what it is that they wanted. And so the people spoke and said they wanted a clean and aesthetically pleasing and safe community because they felt like the drug dealers and all of the people who were bringing down the community was taking the community over. And people didn't feel comfortable coming out their own front doors or going in their own backyards. So when we are sitting here saying we want a safe and aesthetically pleasing community, then that sounds like a great idea for Eddie George to partner with me and go and see the commissioner. Fortunately for me, the commissioner at that time was Gerald Nicely. 
And he had also been the executive director of MDHA. And in 1996, he had a study done about Jefferson Street. And in that study, they said they needed some aesthetically pleasing things to take place on Jefferson Street. New light poles, benches, trash cans, banners, and other things. So I said, you know, I think if I can go and talk to the commissioner, we might be on to something. So I talked to my board chair, who happened to be the deputy director of the Democratic Party. So he got a little pull, and he got me in to see the commissioner. Well, when I got there, they didn't let me see the commissioner. They just let me see his staff. And I said, well, I wanted to come, and I really appreciate you all keeping the place clean for us and cutting the grass and doing all of these wonderful things. But what I would really like to do is to really get a nice decorative something really, really pretty for Jefferson Street to talk about our history, to talk about all of these wonderful things that people have done in this community. And they said, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, I think the best way for us to do it is to get Eddie George. You know, he's the Heisman Trophy winner, and they just came back from the Super Bowl, and I think this is just a great plan. And they said, well, that is surely a good plan. You going to bring Eddie George to us? I'm like, yes, I am. I'm going to get Eddie George and I'm going to bring him to you. And he said, okay, well, you bring Eddie George and then you can see the commission. I said, okay, then, thank you. You know, I got outside the door and I was like, how in the world am I going to get Eddie George? <laughs> but you know what? It pays to work late. Because I was in my office, believe it or not, about 7 o'clock one night in a little office Nobody over there but me in the office sitting back off the street. You know where it is, Kathy. People wouldn't believe it. But I tell you what, I look up and I look down like this because it's steps. And I see this silhouette of a man with all of these muscles <laughs> coming and this bald head. And I'm looking and I'm like, oh my God. It was Eddie George. I was like, oh, my God, Mr. George, I need to talk to you. Can you come and talk to me? Let me tell you what I want to do. You know, I got these students over here at Tennessee State, Fisk and Meharry, and when they get off the interstate, the parents bringing them to school, they get off the interstate, and you see what they see over here, and we need something that's going to be pretty, something that's going to make them feel like, they, he said, like they're coming home? I said, yes, yeah. so I had him at that time. He, because I was talking so fast, he couldn't say anything. And I said, well, you know what I need for you to go downtown with me to meet with the commissioner and tell him what we need to do over here. Because, you know, the Tennessee Titans, all of you all over here, y'all making all that money, and I need for you all to invest money over here. And if you would just do this, you don't even have to give me money. Just come and go with me, go to see the commissioner. And would you do that with me? And he was like, yeah, I guess I will. I guess I will. <laughs> he went and talked to Jeff Carr. He said, she crazy. Is that lady crazy? <laughs> Because I kept going in there, and I kept, so persistence pays, too. So, you know, persistence, working late, and persistence, all of that pays off. But long story short, Eddie George went down there with me to see Mr. Nicely, and we walked in there. Now, you know, we had pictures, and we were taking pictures all over the place, you know. I'm like, yeah, this is my Eddie George. I mean, yes. Mm -hmm. We took all of the pictures. Yes. Come on, Eddie. Come on. Uh -huh. Yeah. Y'all need our picture? Okay, come on. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, we did it. We did it like that. So Mr. Uh, Nicely let us in, and I said, Mr. Nicely, all I'm doing is trying to implement something that you did in 1996. This is not my idea. It's yours. And I just want to implement it. If you put a 20-year study together, and all we do is put it up on the shelf, what was the purpose of paying all that money? Let's make it happen. It's still good. And that was like in 2002. And he said, you're right. Let me see what I can do. And after that, they were able to give the Edge Group, which is Eddie George's company, you know, letters of his first name and his last name, E-D-G-E, Pretty clever, huh? 
the age group, they gave them a grant in order for them to come up with renderings and what this area could look like. And a few years after that, Tennessee State was able to get a HUD grant to transform the Heritage Plaza, is what we call it now. And the, 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 the whole project was called Gateway to Heritage. It was landscaping for the Jefferson Street community and then the Heritage Plaza. TSU received a grant from um, HUD for $400,000. And we were able to put pillars under the plaza, up and down Jefferson Street that talked about the history. If you have an opportunity, I highly recommend, encourage you to go and to see how wonderful this history is. We focused on five things, and that was athletics, civil rights, education, music, and religion in that community. And I talked about earlier about unity and people coming together. It was our organization, JUMP, Tennessee State University, Meharry Medical College. We had Public Works, TDOT, Los and Associates, um, and another public agency. Did I say Public Works? All of them, we all came together and work together to make this project work. And it is absolutely beautiful. There is a mural on the back wall of the plaza that focuses on Jefferson Street, its past, its present, and its future. The things that we wanted to be, the things we wanted to come to. And it is just beautiful. There was a heritage conference. What really inspired that not only was the high grass and the high crime, but there was a conference at MTSU, and they wanted to focus, a heritage conference, and they wanted to focus on Jefferson Street, and the workshop that they had on Jefferson Street was the first workshop to sell out. And when they came over to meet with me and some other people, they were highly disappointed. They were like, you've got a wonderful history, wonderful reputation, but it's nothing here. Nothing to show how wonderful the nightlife and the entertainment and all those things were. So that inspired us to try to make, we, make sure we had something tangible in that community talking about the things that were done. Because when you think about it, from then to now, you know they're celebrating a 50-year Super Bowl. The, the, the uh, NFL has contacted President Glover at TSU, invited her to come to the Super Bowl because when that started, when the Super Bowl started, Tennessee State had more players go to the Super Bowl than any other one institution at that time. It's unbelievable, isn't it? But it did. I'm going to tell you something else that you probably didn't know. The first interracial tennis match was played at Fisk University in Tennessee. People didn't know that. Did you know Tennessee State had five people to play for the Harlem Globetrotters? Isn't it amazing of the history? So much history. It's just absolutely beautiful. It gives me goosebumps. But you know, from the time that I started at Jump in 1999 to today, I've been telling people how wonderful that community is, how beautiful it is. And some people listened. Some people heard what I was saying. People saw that Germantown had beautiful structures beautiful homes. And they went over there and they decided that they would find the homes. You know, with the Home Depot and the home decorations and all of these things coming now, looking at what it was and what it could be. And that's what they have made Germantown and Salem Town. Not looking at what it was, but what it could be. And that's exactly the way I see Jefferson Street. 
Not necessarily what it was, but what it could be. Who would have thought that we would have a Nashville Sounds Stadium, brand spanking new, as my daddy would say, on Jefferson Street? Who would have thought that? All of the wonderful, wonderful buildings that are there and that are coming. It's a beautiful thing. We were down, but we were not out. You know, you got to get knocked out three times before they call it. <laughs> we were just down, but we were not out. And I think that we're well on our way from where we were to where we could be. We've had Grammy Awards with the night train to Nashville, the music celebrating. So now we have things that are tangible that people can see about this history. You talk about some brilliant minds. You know, Booker T. Washington used to spend a lot of time at Fisk University. All of these names, George Washington Carver, these names in history. John Hope Franklin, a graduate of Fisk University. W.E.B. Du Bois, you know it, yes. Even the uh, guy who came up with uh, our black national anthem. James Weldon Johnson. Who is, the, who is that intellect in this room to know all that? Yes. Yes. But it's beautiful, and I absolutely love it. And also to celebrate the wonderful music, Jump has an annual jazz and blues festival. By the way, which is coming up this June, June 17th and 18th, and we moved it from off Jefferson Street, and it's now at the Bicentennial Mall. Because it's a structured area, absolutely beautiful room for the entire family. And and I think this year we're going to focus on some blues. We've done jazz and we've had R&B, but we're going to focus on a little blues. But I didn't know I Will Survive, Gloria Gaynor. Heard of her? Mm Mm-hmm. What about Mississippi Boy? Charles Jones, I'm a Mississippi boy, you heard of him? He's a new blues guy. Bobby Rush, I know you know Betty Wright. Tonight's the night. Yeah, so we're gonna gonna do it big. So we hope that you will come out and join us and enjoy the live and fabulous music on Jefferson Street and help us create Not what it was, but what it was meant to be. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions. I have information about the organization JUMP itself and the things that we do. Um, But I, I want to tell you, we have a workforce development program that I am no longer a part of simply because I became a councilwoman and we were receiving funds from Metro, so we had to separate JUMP from the Workforce Development Program. But the shuttle services that we have, um, I think that you will enjoy, thank you. I think you will enjoy reading about some of the things that we do. I'm really, really pleased about the shuttle service, and I'm going to shut up. I can talk about Jefferson Street and all the things that we do all day long, so I'm going to let you talk now. Yeah, you mentioned about Dewford Ford Bailey right? yes. and Jefferson, and I had the honor of playing piano with him and his buddies, and I was just, uh, no matter what I play, he was just all over. He was yes. great, and I hear him sitting with this guy that played with Ray Charles and Duke Ellington. So I had to ask him, I said, I understand that you played with uh, Jimi Hendrix. And he goes, no, Jimi Hendrix played in my band. This way. <laughs> uh, and later, Hendrix said he really learned how to play in Nashville. Yes. Yes. So I, that was a great night. I enjoyed it. Yes, and you know, Jimi Hendrix had a group called the Gypsies, and Billy Cox was one. It was a three-man band, and Billy Cox was one of those guys, and he lives in Nashville. He had his residence here, although he was not from Nashville, just like me, but came here and couldn't leave it. It's something infectious about it. Yes. Yes, ma'am. What do you, do you have anything like on the horizon, any projects specifically that you want to see? Well, I don't have any projects 
But there are some developers that are doing projects. First of all, MDHA is doing a development at 10th and Jefferson in front of the Hope Gardens, which Hope Gardens, to me, is the model transformation of a community that went from chaos to community. Because they were a part of the Jefferson Street community, but they didn't get quite affected as much as the, the west, the further west, down towards uh, Tennessee State, where the major uh, interstate was done. Um, but they have a, a, it's a beautiful community where it's just, uh, it's almost like a Norman Rockwell. Everything you see the kids playing, out, I'm gonna tell you what happened in that community. You had young, old, black, white, tall, skinny, and all of it. There was a young man who was living with his grandmother involved in a lot of drug activity. And he sh shot up the house. Some people came and shot the house, and one lady was grazed by a gun shot. And the community was in uproar, and they called and told them that they were upset about what they were doing. They called a community meeting. Do you know that this young man went to the community meeting and apologized to the neighbors? It was just that kind of a community that they were like, this is not right. You should not do this. But we love you anyway. And if you need some help, we will get you some help. But we are in this with you. And you don't have to do this. And he came and apologized. It was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. The grandmother passed. I think he still did this little nonsense. But his grandmother passed. And um, they did not keep the house, and they were able to move on. But it was the character uh, of the people that were in that community that I think make a difference. So right there at the corner at 10th and Jefferson, um, MDHA is going to bring uh, 54 apartments, two- and three-bedroom homes, and um, they're going to be uh, affordable housing as well as some market-rate housing. And we're really, really excited about that. There's a gentleman by the name of DJ Woodson who's also doing a development at 1821 Jefferson Street, which is close to Citizens Bank. I mentioned that earlier. And they are going to do uh, mixed use, where there's going to be a Bungo Java, Smoothie King, and some apartments there, which is going to be perfect for the students at Meharry and Fisk because they'll be able to come down and, and walk. You don't necessarily have to have transportation to get there. And the students from TSU, I think, will find it a lovely afternoon walk during the spring and summertime. Yes. There's one more. The Hardy's Barbershop. Right there, and see, a lot of people don't know, but right next to the Harvest Barbershop used to be the Ritz Theater, the first Ritz Theater. It wasn't all the way down close to the interstate like people thought it was. It was right there, almost at D.B. Todd. And you know who stayed next to him? This guy by the name of, of Hatcher, I think is his name. And he was the guy, his, his star, his, um, Star name was Edwin Starr. You know, he had a, you know, when they move and become a star, they don't use that Charles Hatchet. And, and his na real name was, I mean, his stage name was Edwin Starr. He's the one that, that did the song War. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. War, yeah. That's who, that Edwin Starr lived right there as well. But, but there's a, a development that's taking place. And when people don't realize that when the government invests money into your community, then it, it, it promotes private investments. So all of this is taking place. When MDHA brought their development, then Mr. Woodson was able to come and bring something. And we've got Mr. Coleman, who's tried and worked very, very long time to bring a development to Jefferson Street. So we're really, really excited about the projects that are uh, ongoing on Jefferson Street. Mr. Hunter. Are you going to implement just kind of a music culture again? Is that something that's happening? That is something that I would really love to do, is to bring some nightlife back to the corridor. I think it's very much needed, and I think it's very much wanted. A lot of people come over to that area looking to get some good music, and I think that 
as things are continuing to develop and to grow, I think we'll, we'll soon get to that point where I think we can. You know, a lot of people have tried here uh, lately, but I don't think that the community was completely ready for it. You know, it's still in the transformation period, and I think one day we will get there. The Jazz Workshop is off of Monroe. I don't know if many of you all have been there, but it is amazing. And they have quite a few shows there at the end of Monroe, over there by where the Newhoff uh, Center. Beautiful. Sure. Uh -huh. uh, Mike, I want to mention that on, uh, I think it's June the 12th of this month, which is a Friday, uh, the African, it's the 33rd or 34th of something uh, African American cultural series. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that Don Susick's going to be talking about some of the music and the Jubilee Singers will be uh, uh, giving a presentation mm -hmm. there. So mm -hmm. if you wanted to uh, hear some of the Jubilee Singers, uh, that would be a good place. But it's an all-day seminar right. that the Historic Commission puts on every year. It is, and, and the Jubilee Singers are still doing some great works. And Tennessee State University has wonderful musicians to come through. Uh, I don't know if you all remember Hank Crawford, who was a, a wonderful jazz musician out of Memphis, came to Tennessee State University, even our very own Joe Johnson. Not the Joe Johnson Street Joe Johnson. But Johnson, he's also from Memphis, but he's a saxophonist, and he owns a couple of night... Um, um, well, not they don't they don't consider them nightclubs, but a couple of um, event spaces with weekend and agenda. He and uh, he, and he has partners that they are doing that. So we do have some live music from time to time at those uh, events. And Carla those, Thomas went to TSU. Yes, Carla Thomas. All of my Memphis folk, all of my homegirls, and you, you think I can sing? Okay, I'm not going to sing. I'm not going to sing. I'm not going to sing for you today. I'm not going to sing for you today. <laughs> I sing good with a choir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are there any other questions? No more questions? Yes. How did Eddie George, did you ever find out why he showed up at your office? Yes. Okay. Now, you know, Eddie is now an actor. And Jeff Carr, Jeff Obafemi Carr, who was the founder and owner of Amun Ra Theater, was also housed in the same building that my office was housed in. And he was providing Eddie with some private lessons for his acting. So that's why Eddie showed up for that. And, uh, and I was just fortunate and not shy. So that was the other thing, is three things. You got to work late, you got to be persistent, and you can't be shy. So don't be shy. If there's something you want to know, you better ask me before, we, before it's all over with. But that was it. And it was, and it was really, really good. And every time he sees me, now, he's like, hey, how are you? You know, really good because, as you know, he actually, the, his uh, company actually did become project managers of the Gateway to Heritage project, which we spent over $2 million on that project, and it is absolutely beautiful. And so it did become uh, very lucrative. Now, I thought they were going to be putting money in our community. I didn't know we were going to be paying them to do something. <laughs> but that's what it turned out. I don't know. Maybe it was the muscles. I don't know. What you think? <laughs> yes, Terry. We've got so many young people, new people moving to Nashville. We need to remind them of the Tiger Bells and Coach Temple and, and what he did with almost nothing there. Oh, absolutely. That is, that is, that's, it's so much history. When you think about the Tiger Bells, when you think about Wilma Rudolph, and, um, as a matter of fact, you know, I'm proud to say that I was in school with Chandra Cheeseboro, who was a gold Olympus during that time, and Kathy McMillan. Also, Kathy didn't get a gold, but she got a silver medal. But for the Tiger Bells and Coach Temple, what he did, how many teams did he took to the Olympics, and how many teams he coached in the Olympics has been 
um, just outstanding and amazing. And all of that history is right there in that North Nashville community. It is just beautiful. You know, I think about, it doesn't even matter, you can talk about golf with, with Joe Hampton and um, Ted Rose, the elder, those people who were right here in Nashville. Nashville has uh, bred some wonderful, outstanding people. And, and I am so proud to call it my home. And I know that, that, that Memphis has done the same. They bred some wonderful people. And one particular one that I can think of, uh, and I'm not talking about Elvis, no. <laughs> I'm talking about uh, some woman that walks around Nashville with gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> Did y'all just now get there? <laughs> oh my God. Yes, sir. I just want to say that I thoroughly enjoy when Tennessee State plays at the Titans game. Mm -hmm. And I think I ought to be there every game. Oh my God. You know, I was going to say something about that. Because just this Saturday, they were in Atlanta with the Honda Battle of the Bands. And they played, and they did outstanding. It was beautiful. If you would go on the internet and Google it, you'll see, uh, see how they played, and you'll see some other bands as well, because it's a competition again with them all. And that's the thing that I just love, you know, how the drum majors, they, you know, they do that back bend and go all the way back and put their head on the ground, and I'm like, man, I just love it. I love it, it's wonderful. Well, they really do, so you talk about talent. And I can tell you more than that about Tennessee State, before we were able to do the Gateway to Heritage, we had to have a maintenance agreement because they have, Public Works has done a lot of landscape projects around town and they're not maintained. But Tennessee State and Meharry Medical College stepped to the plate and said that they were going to make sure that they provided assistance in order for us to have that project maintained. And it has been maintained beautifully over these past years <coughs> with Jump, Fisk, not Fisk, but Meharry and Tennessee State University. So I have to give a lot of credit and, and, and love to them for how they came in the community to make sure that we maintain this project. So thank you for recognizing that. Any other questions? Comments? I was going to say, I hope the Tennessee State Museum will work down that corner of Jefferson Street will be able to help a whole lot. Oh, I think it's going to bring so much uh, to that community. You know, I think right there that we're going to be able to bring it all together because we've got the Van Vecten Art Gallery at Fisk and we're going to have the Tennessee State Museum. So from one end to the other end, you're going to be able to just see and do any and everything. And I know um, uh, Greg Ridley, who was responsible for a lot of the copper work that you see here in the Nashville Library. He was an art professor at Tennessee State and Fisk University, and the art that he has done is just amazing. So I, if you do, take a call me. I'll give you a tour if you want to. I'm serious. I'll give you a tour. I'll talk to you and tell you, because yeah. like I said, I can talk about this all day, even though I don't think the council is going to let me talk about it all day now, because I got so much work to do. But anytime, I'm going to give you my card. You can call me, and I'd love to, to take you down there and show you around. Thank you all so much. You've been wonderful. Well, I want to thank Sharon for being here today and taking time out of our schedule to be here. And, you know, if you ever want to meet the archivist, bring Eddie George. That would be really cool. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, you know, hi. You know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anything else? Um, be sure and come back for our March 1st Tuesday. Have a good afternoon.